Well, like I shared last night, I, I kind of want to give testimony as well as open the Word of God a bit. Um, I've had a really uh, exciting summer. Um, it's, I know it's October now, but uh, this summer was really pivotal, pivotal for us. And uh, uh, I want to start in John chapter 2. Uh, John chapter 2, you don't need to turn there. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. Um, but John chapter 2 is one of the strangest stories in the Bible. Because, you know, wine is kind of controversial depending on where you are in the world, right? You know, you go to certain parts and they can't even believe it's a controversy. You go to, I used to teach in a Bible school that you would never even consider. It's, it's a controversial issue, right? And yet here is Yeshua doing his first miracle in John chapter 2, and it's connected to this thing that would one day be so controversial. Why? Why, God, would you put this story right here, right in the beginning? And it's a really interesting story. I want to unpack it for you a little bit because Yeshua is going to a wedding. How many of you like to go to, hey, Jane, I just saw you there. God bless you. <laughs> How many of you like to go to weddings? Isn't it fun to go to a wedding, get to dress up, right? You know, and by the way, one of the reasons I moved to Israel is so I could go to a wedding without getting dressed up. Uh, <laughs> I once went to a wedding where the most famous person at the wedding, he's actually now a big shot politician, was wearing jeans and a black t-shirt. And I said, yes, this is my country. And, uh, but, uh, you know, in an Israeli wedding, uh, it, you, very similar probably to weddings back then, you know, it's exciting. And, and Yeshua's going and his mom is going, right? Miriam's going, the, the, the disciples are going, at least the ones he had had chosen already, they're all going to this wedding in Cana in Galilee. And there's kind of an excitement, right, before you go to a wedding. And, you know, uh, I have a, one of our elders in our congregation, when he get, because he's a pastor, he gets all these invitations. He, he, he calls them doch, dochim, which means a, a ticket, like a, like a fine, because, you know, there's 500 shekels, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> but he's a really godly man, so I, I, don't, I won't tell you his name. Uh, <laughs> And he, he, he's such a servant, loves to go. But they're excited. They're going to a wedding and they get dressed up and they go to the wedding and something tragic happens at this wedding. Yeshua's mother comes to him in the middle of this wedding and she says, Azara Yain. There's even an exclamation point in certain versions. They've run out of wine. Now, for most of us growing up in a Christian culture, we can't imagine that that would be a bad thing. In fact, that might even be a good thing. We think, praise God, you know, they've run out of wine, enough with the, you know. But that's not how she was thinking. Now, I don't know what Mary would have gone through that day, Miriam. I don't know if she had had, you know, like me, had to drive through all this traffic to get to Cana, and she just wanted a glass of wine. I don't know. But she was very upset that they had run out of wine. Now, if you're watching this in the Bible Belt, just a few more minutes. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyways, she's very concerned about it. And to be honest with you, all jokes aside, she's probably worried about the reputation of the bridegroom and his parents. Probably they, they are friends. And I also know in a wedding here in Israel, if you go to a wedding... Uh, how many of you have been to a wedding here? You go into a wedding and there is the reception, right? There's food, there's drink, and, and uh, this is before the meal. And then there's a ceremony, a tekis, right? And, and, and during the ceremony, everybody's talking. It, they don't, it's, it, where I grew up in America, the ceremony, I mean, you don't, you, <laughs> so pretty. <laughs> right? It, it's, a, it's a very, it's an awesome moment. So when I first got to Israel and, and I married a Moroccan Israeli, one of the, the largest ethnic groups, one of the largest ethnic groups in Israel, probably number two next to Russian-speaking Jews, uh, are the uh, Moroccan Jews. And they know how to celebrate, and there's lots of stuff that we won't talk about. And, uh, and there's lots of food, and the food is so good. You get there, and they're eating food. And then the wedding, and everybody's talking during the wedding. They're 
But they're talking. And so, but then there's after the wedding. They're married now. Then there's food. You go, you sit down immediately. There's hummus on the table. There's, there's salads on the, it's so good you're eating. And, and then you dance a little bit. You burn some calories. And then you go and you sit down for a second meal, which is really your third meal. Because you had the appetizers coming in. Now imagine if at the beginning of that time, maybe shortly after the ceremony or during the reception, they ran out of wine. That would be a bouchard, an embarrassment, a shame. They would be talking about you for months. Did you hear about Shlomi's wedding? They ran out of wine during the reception. So embarrassing. They're so cheap. That's exactly what would have happened. But Mary, she's concerned. Mary says, no, they, they do something. And he's like, oh, goodness gracious. He, he doesn't even call her mom or mommy or mother. He says, woman, Isha, woman, what does this have to do with me? My time is not yet. You know, I just got anointed by John the other day. I went in the water. I came up. I'm ready to start my ministry. I'm thinking about what am I going to do for my first miracle? Maybe I'll raise the dead, right? You know, let's just start right up here. You're worried about wine? And you know, there's certain liberties you can take when you are the mother of the Messiah. I mean, he was God on earth, but at the she raised him as a baby, and she just says no. And she turns to the servants, do whatever he says, do it. And he's like, ugh. Something, I mean, that's how I imagine. If you read the gospel, there were times when Yeshua was frustrated. His disciples couldn't cast out a demon. And he was like, oh man, how long must I put up with you? That probably hurt a little bit. I, I mean, that would be hard for me to hear Yeshua say that to me. How long must I? He's probably thinking that right now. <laughs> Why are you clapping? <laughs> Yeah, I think it was water I drank on the way over here. <laughs> Anyways, so he tells, she takes liberty. He's a little frustrated, but he tells him, he says, all right, you know what? Those six jars over there, and those were ceremonial pots. And he said, fill them up with water. And then some time, at some moment, from uh, the, the time that they begin to fill them up to the time that they scooped some of that out and served it to the master of the ceremonies, that water had turned not just into wine. That would be a miracle, but it turned into super exclusive, amazing wine. Now, the first point I want to make is this, is that we are those clay jars, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he's speaking about us? He says we are jars of clay, earthen vessels. That's what we're dust of the earth. We're nothing, but he talks about the jars of the clay, the jars of clay and the glory of God being revealed through the jars. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons that God wants to use us, I'll just speak for me. I graduated high school with a 1.7 GPA. I read one book by the time I graduated high school. I've written more books than I read in high school. I don't know too many people. I don't know if I'm proud of that or ashamed, but it's, it's a fact. The point is, if God can use me, if he can, people who knew me back then... If God could take my messed up, dysfunctional, broken life and turn it into something good that blesses other people, then they can see the glory of God in this jar of clay. And that's what happens when we are immersed in the Holy Spirit, is that our water becomes wine. By the way, you are uh, uh, four-fifths, I think, water, right? Something like that, three-fourths. We're mostly water. Until the Holy Spirit comes upon us like he did the disciples in Acts chapter 2. And their water was turned into wine and they turned the world upside down. Look at Peter. I mean, this is a guy that made a lot of mistakes during the three years that we get to see him, right? I mean, not only did he deny the Lord, even calling down curses. You remember he's up on the Mount of Transfiguration, 
And I mean, honestly, there are times in life that you, even I know this, you just shut up. <laughs> and when Yeshua is glowing in front of you, and there's Elijah, and there's Moses, you don't want to be the first to talk. <laughs> you know? But he, hey, let's go down to the hardware store, and we're going to build some tabernacles. We're going to do one for Moses, Elijah, one for you too, Yeshua. And the Lord in heaven, God the Father, rebuked him, I believe, because he compared the Son of God, to Moses and Elijah. But the point is, he just was always doing the wrong thing. I know he walked on water, but he fell in water. But he did walk on water. Very zealous fellow, that Peter. But always making mistakes. Until Acts chapter 2. When God turns his water into wine, and he suddenly, he becomes a different man. He, he, he stands before the Jews of Jerusalem. It says there were Jewish people from all over the world. I know some people read that and think there were simply people from all over the world. They were actually Jewish pilgrims from all over the world that had come for Shavuot, for Pentecost, as one of the three uh, commanded times to come up to Jerusalem. And they just have, very strategic of God, of course, to, to, to do that on that day. And he gets up and he says, men of Israel. And he preaches his first evangelistic message. And 3,000, can you imagine going to the, the Western Wall right now and being anointed and bringing that message and Orthodox Jews fall on their face and begin to repent? That's what was happening there. And there was so much joy in the city as they baptized, they immersed in water 3,000 Jewish people. The worst thing you can do, by the way, in, in, in terms of rabbinical Judaism, is to be immersed in water. That, that's like the act of a traitor. But it wasn't always like that. These 3,000 Jews, they didn't have a problem with it. They didn't say, oh, wait a minute, that's a Christian. The, the, no, there was no such thing as a Christian tradition. All they had was the Bible and Judaism and Jewish tradition and immersion in water was a huge part of Jewish life and culture. You couldn't go into the temple without going into, uh, into the waters of immersion. But can you imagine that joy? Can you just, just picture you're in Jerusalem. The presence of God is there. There is revival in the city and, and they're just, go, you know, the way... Uh, the immersion tanks were, and you could, if you've been to the southern steps, you've probably seen, you know, you walk down into the water, you walk up. Can you imagine people walking in, repenting, broken? You know, what must we do to be saved? Repent and be immersed is what Peter said, right? And they repented, and then they went into the water, and they came out on the other side, new creations. Hallelujah. I would, I would love to relive that. I can't wait to one day watch the archives in heaven of that day. I'm sure it was glorious. But the point, point number one, is that God turns our water into wine. But here's the problem, is we forget. We forget. Who woke up this morning and said, yes, hallelujah, I am filled with holy wine, with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to reach somebody today for Yeshua. I'm going to get a word of knowledge. I'm going to, get a, I'm going to pray for a saint. I can't wait to find an unbeliever and share with them. Because that's what we're supposed to be like. That would be, no, that's the normal believing life. Because you're so grateful. You're like, oh God, you've changed me. You've saved me. You rescued me. I just have to tell other people about this amazing thing. If you were in a fire and you were dying and smoke was coming into your lungs and you had one breath left and, and then somebody just grabs you and pulls you out and rescues you, you would be singing that person's praises for the rest. Can I tell you what happened? I got this, that guy, he, that's how we should be. Every day, but we forget. I'm not condemning you. I'm, I'm the same way. We forget. We get, we get caught up in life, and I got this meeting, and we're doing that. Even in ministry, I mean, you could be busy doing TV shows, and I mean, I walk in, and they're putting makeup on. What's up with that? I, no, I, I like to wear makeup. <laughs> I just wasn't expecting it right when I walked in. But, you know, we get busy, we're doing TV, and we get media, and then Facebook, and we're reaching people, and, oh, they liked my post, oh, look how many people, like. we get caught, even in ministry, and we forget the most important thing, that he left us here to tell other people. 
See, I think, that, remember the demoniac? See, a lot of us would love to just die and go to heaven, right? That wouldn't be so bad, you know? But he left us here. Why? To reach other It's like that demoniac. He said, hey, man, Jesus, you're awesome. I want to hang out with you. I want to come with you. I want to be one of you. No, no, no. You stay here in the Decapolis and be an evangelist. So that's number one. He turns our water. Remember that because it's in you. It's living. You got to let it out. You have to release it. The second thing is this, is why is that prophecy, or rather, why is that story there? Because it's an amazing story. The guy takes the water that had been turned into wine, and he walks over to the master of the ceremonies, and the master of the ceremonies, he takes that, that water that had been turned into wine, and he drinks, and he goes, whoa, dude, do you, nobody does what you do. You know, normally what they do is they serve you the good wine first, and then they give you the cheap stuff once you've had a little bit too much to drink, and you don't care, or you don't know, or either, or neither, or both. <laughs> But you've saved the best for last. <laughs> Do you see that right there? You see that? I believe, honestly, the reason that that story is right there, right at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry, is because God is saying to us on planet Earth, 2,000 years later, you see the amazing miracles that he did? You see how he raised the dead, how he healed the sick, how it spilled over into the book of Acts in the life of, of the disciples? I've saved the best for last. It's, it's going to be. And why do we need that word? Because it's hard. You look around. There's terrorism. There's ISIS. There is uh, 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 so much division and hatred. Racism in this world. And God is still saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit. I have saved the best for last. I do not have a doom and gloom theology for the end times. I do believe there will be an antichrist. I do believe he'll be very mean and he'll take over the world. But I believe that at the same time, God's spirit on the, on the kehilada of God, on the body of believers, is going to grow, is going to increase. Because I believe that what we see in the book of Exodus... In the Jewish people, the children of Abraham, and the Egyptians is a picture of the book of Revelation between the Kehilah, the church, and the world. And what happened is plagues came upon Egypt, but it did not touch Goshen. Plagues came upon Pharaoh, but every day Moses was there, anointed and on fire and challenging him like a prophet. And I believe in the end times that even though the world will become darker, we will grow lighter with more grace, more power, more anointing than ever before. But friends, we have to realize what's inside of us, that we have the glory of God in these earthen vessels. We need to live like we have the glory of God in these earthen vessels. And I, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to testify just a little bit now. Um, uh, just some of the things we went through this summer. We had an amazing summer, uh, and it began with, uh, really goes all the way back to November when two guys in our congregation in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, they saw this guy with dreadlocks on YouTube named Todd White, and he's like out on the streets, and people are getting healed, and they're getting saved, and they're crying, and, and they're saying, well, you know, can we do that? And they said, well, Let's try. <laughs> and they went out in Tel Aviv and began to ask people, can we pray for you? Do you have any sickness, anything in your body? And, and, and almost everyone they prayed for was getting healed and then listening to them. And then they came that, that Shabbat or Friday to the congregation. And they said, hey, we, we have a testimony. And they shared with everybody. And then 20 more people went out with them. And then this began to grow as other congregations uh, began to invite them and say, hey, can you come and tell us what you're doing? We, we want to be involved in that. Now, I'm an evangelist more than I am any uh, other gifts. Um, pastor, teacher, prophet, apostle. I'm primarily an evangelist. And you would think that the first time I heard about this, I would be the first. Hey, come on. Yeah, let me. I was kind of. I don't know, blind, asleep, not like, oh, that's great. That's cute. That's wonderful. There was something dormant at me that needed to be 
awakened. And so uh, I got a phone call in May where somebody said to me, hey, Todd White is coming to Israel on a tour. Why isn't he ministering to us? <laughs> he said, that's how Israelis talk. They don't say, can he? They're just already offended. Why? What, what is the deal here? <laughs> and they said, Ron, you work for God TV. Do something. So I said, okay. And I uh, made a few phone calls, sent out a few emails, and we got a hold of their administrator, a guy named uh, Tom, wonderful man. And uh, we arranged a meeting at Yad Shmona, about 20 minutes from here towards Tel Aviv, to, uh, to have a meeting with Todd White. Got a production crew together. It was going to be on Monday night. It was going to be great. We told people to respond by email. We had close to 300 people respond, which in you know, only, and we, there were no tourists invited. It was just local Israeli believers. 300, that's like, that's like a mega congregation in America. 300 is a, especially at last minute. And then on Saturday morning, as I'm sitting in my apartment in Shorish, uh, where we were living temporarily, I get a phone call from this fellow Tom, the administrator, and he says, Ron, I am so sorry. And I'm like, why are you sorry? <laughs> Don't be sorry. <laughs> be happy. He said, no, I'm sorry because we uh, made a double commitment on Monday night, and we have to be at this certain place. It's going to be televised live, and we didn't know, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I said, okay, well, we got 300 people coming Monday night. <laughs> and uh, he said, can you do it Sunday night? I said, well, just to be clear, you do realize that today is Saturday in Israel. Everything is closed, so I can't even answer that question. I won't know till tonight if we can get the venue. I won't know till tonight if we can get the production crew. I won't know tonight if we can get a hold of these 300 people. I don't, ah! And then the grace of God just kind of came on me. I said, you know what, Tom? Don't worry about it. Everything's going to work out. It's going to work out just fine. Don't worry. So we got to work. And uh, literally, we had to email. It, it, I, it wasn't an email list. We had to go into every email, take the address, put it in a new. It, I had two of my staff up until midnight sending out emails. But you know what? The next day, over 300 people came. There was standing room only. Was anybody there for that meeting? Anybody? Anybody? You? Yes. Hallelujah. You guys, it was good, right? It was, it was an, a, a, an amazing night. Uh, lots of healing, salvations, empowerment. My secretary... She was getting migraines every single day at 1.30. She would have to be home in her bed by 1.30. The next day, and she's not, she's not somebody that runs to get prayer. She's reluctant like that. Uh, but, you know, right as we're getting, she's, uh, uh, you, uh, would you pray for me? I get these, he prayed for her. The next day, it's 1.30 and there's no migraine. The next day, it's 1.30 and there's no migraine. That was in June. There's been no migraines. Hallelujah. So we, we had a, a really fun time after that. Uh, we ended, uh, sadly, we ended up in the hospital right after the meeting because his, his wife had broken out in hives, and she was getting treatment. They put her on a Benadryl. She fell asleep. So he said, Let, let's go get some food. You know, we're hungry. We'll... So you know that when right you come into Jerusalem, there's a gas station? And next, I didn't know this, but next to that gas station is the most amazing shawarma and falafel and so as we're going to the gas station, I'm, I said, what is that smell? And so we walk into this room, and everybody in there is Orthodox. Everyone in this, and it's packed. It's midnight, and it is packed, and everyone is wearing white and black, except for me and the guy with dreadlocks next to me. <laughs> so we had fun that day. The next day, we went out, and, and uh, I was just watching this guy live life, and uh, it, the, it's a real deal. I mean, from the time he wakes up to the time he goes, he's thinking, I, I got to share with somebody. I got I to talk to this guy. You, what's wrong with your back? What's wrong with your neck? What's wrong with your mom? You know, and there, you know, she went through this. It's, it's made me jealous. So I went back to my hotel, and there was a guy in my room named Mahmoud. I said, what's the matter with you, Mahmoud? He said, my knee hurts. I said, again, I can't remember how we got to his knee, but we got to his knee, and I said, okay, well, let's pray. Muslim guy from Abu Ghosh, pray for him. He gets healed immediately. The next day, he comes back. He sees my wife. He says, where's your husband? I have to thank him. I have no pain in my knee. The next day, a guy, a, a guy named Ahmad gets healed in the elevator. These are all workers in the hotel, Muslims. The next day, Rafa which interestingly in Hebrew means healing. It's the same root for healing. But Rafa, uh, also from Abu Ghosh, he's got a knee brace on, works in their dining room. 
And it was just crazy. I said, hey, man, let me just pray for your, your knee. And I prayed for him, and he gets healed. And I'm telling you about Yeshua and about salvation and that he's got to go back and pray. And it's not Muhammad. And uh, <laughs> I saw Rafa the, uh, two weeks ago. That was in June. I saw him two weeks ago. I was staying at the same hotel. I walk in there. He sees me, big smile on his face. He says, in Hebrew, he tells me he has had no pain. He doesn't wear his brace anymore. No pain since June. <laughs> the next day, the next day, I meet this guy cleaning rooms in the, in the uh, I mean, I was just focused, you know? And he's, there's, there's uh, this guy in the a Sudanese ref, refugee, one of their uh, cleaners, and he said that his back was in such pain that he had gone to the doctor on Sunday, but he could barely work. And I said, well, let's pray. We pr Again, I'm just making this quick. Uh, for time's sake, gets healed. Uh, the next day, I'm leaving. It's over. I'm leaving this hotel. It was during the firm conference. And I'm leaving the hotel. And the lady at the front desk, she says to me, I said, can you watch my, my bags real quick? I'm going to um, uh, get my car. She said, yeah, yeah, sure. But wait, what? Can you heal people? <laughs> now, let me just say this. I had preached a message oh, before any of this happened, like a week earlier in our current, and it was really based on the testimonies of others, what God was doing in other people in our congregation. We, I, I saw uh, one of our uh, uh, staff on a video in Tel Aviv praying for people and them getting healed. It was in one after another. And I said, friends, if we... If we take this, if we run with this, if we do this, what's going to happen is people will start coming to us and saying, are you the people who can heal the sick? I didn't realize it would happen a week later. And to me, it reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. She had heard about Yeshua, and you, you can't even imagine how, how weak this poor woman must have been, bleeding for 12 years the rejection that she suffered, you know, being perpetually unclean. She couldn't get married. And she hears about the rabbi. He's coming through her town. And she, she I mean, so weak, so tired. She fights through the crowd. Just, she says, if I can just touch his clothes, the fringe of his garment, his seat, seat, if I can just, then maybe I'll be healed. Daughter, your faith. That's what, it's, that's what will happen. They will come to us and say, I heard you were the people who heal the sick. And so she said to me, can you heal the sick? And I said, well, no, not really, but I, I can pray and God can heal you. And I explained to her that it was Yeshua. And she, again, in Hebrew, Yeshua, they, they don't call him Yeshua often. They call him Yeshu, which is a long story. It's an acronym that was a play on words from Yeshua, but it's a curse, not a blessing. And Yeshua sounds very much like Yehoshua, which is Joshua. In fact, in Greek, the same exact word, Isus, is used for Joshua and for Jesus, Yeshua alike. It's virtually the same name. So she thought I was saying that Joshua, in the name of Joshua, you can be healed. So I gave, I, we prayed for her. Joshua healed her. Yeshua healed her. She got healed. <laughs> and I said, all right, listen, you got to read this book. Uh, it, it's a book I wrote called Identity Theft. It was, we translated it to Hebrew, gave her a copy. Here's the point, is we have this inside of us. You say, well, Ron, you're special. You're an evangelist. Well, if, if that's true at any level, then if I am an evangelist, it means that my job is to equip the saints for works of ministry, which means that whatever I've done, you can do. And whatever you, let's forget me, whatever Yeshua did, he said you will do. And even greater things than this will you do. We made fun of Peter earlier, but you got to get out of the boat if you're ever going to walk on water. And while he did eventually fail, you know what? John, James, the, both of the Jameses, Thomases, the Judases, uh, Bartholomew, you know what they never did? They never walked on water. I would take three steps on the Galilee over being a chicken in the boat. You got to get out of the boat, friends. You got to uh, uh, just take a step. 
Don't be afraid. Yeah, well, well, what, what, what if I pray for a, a sick person and they don't get healed? Well, they'll probably stone you. <laughs> they'll probably throw rotten tomatoes at you. Listen. If you pray for a sick person and nothing happens, if they feel worse after you pray for them, they're going to look you in the eye and say, thank you so much. I was on a plane just a few days after that going to Prague, and this guy comes by me, and he sits down, or he talks to the stewardesses, flight attendants, and he says to them, uh, I, I'm really sick, I need help, you know, and, and they're, they just kind of blow him off. He was probably hung over. He was on a bachelor party going from Israel to Prague. And, and uh, so they said, well, just sit down here in the front row. And they gave him some water. And, and I walked up to him. I said, can I pray for you? I, I said, you don't feel good. He said, oh, it won't work. I said, well, actually, when I pray for people, God heals them. I'm getting a little confident by this point. <laughs> and so he says, okay, fine. I pray for him. He, God touches him. I said, what do you feel? He said, well, I, I feel love. And he said, I feel love coming from you. He said, the, these women here, they hate me. Those were his words. Him, him sanuoti, they hate me, but you don't even work on the airplane, and yet you cared about me. And now I feel great. Now, even if he didn't get healed, he'd be grateful. That I, we got to take a step. But I want to share this in the four minutes and 55 seconds that I have left, 54, 53, 52. All of this comes from a place of intimacy with God, a place of confidence in knowing that he's with you, that he's in you. With all these things happening, I had this amazing experience this summer. I was in Colorado, and I'll make this short, but I was going from uh, 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 Breckenridge to Aspen. Now, just to be clear, I've never been to Aspen in my life. I don't, I don't get to go to places like that very often, but I was invited by a minister friend of mine to spend a day with him fly fishing in Breckenridge. And I originally turned him down because I wasn't going to fly to Breckenridge to fly fish for a day. It didn't seem like a good use of time or money. Though I, I like the fellow very much. Um, but then I got an invitation to speak in Denver. And I thought, you know what? Let's go. We'll do the then. Then we'll go to Denver. And in the middle, uh, I'm going to take you, honey, my wife, Ilana, I'm going to take you to Aspen. You know, we've never been there. It's beautiful. So we found great hotel rooms there. Really cheap. Hotwire.com. There's a plug for you. And we get there, and I notice that the keys to the car of my ministry friend are in my car, which means that when I left, because you don't need to actually use keys anymore, <laughs> they just have to be. So when I left, I must have grabbed his keys thinking they were mine, and my keys were already in the car, and I thought, oh no. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go all the way back. They didn't even have a spare set, which meant I, they couldn't even meet me halfway. They had no car. So the next day I was going to wake up and go, and I was so mad at myself. And not just this, I felt, I felt like God was probably saying, you deserve this. Who do you think you are going to Aspen? If you've ever been to Aspen, it is for the rich and famous. It is not for me. And I felt really guilty. Oh, God's mad at me. He's punishing me. I deserve, you ever go through that? Because the enemy, he, if he's anything, he's a liar. I mean, he is a good liar, but I'm believing this. I'm feeling really bad about myself. And I wake up the next morning, and I start driving, and I'm just mad. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at me. I'm mad at everybody. I got to have two hours and then two hours back. And I said, Lord, why did you let this happen? And he spoke to me very clearly. And he said, I wanted to spend time with you. <laughs> okay, that works for me. It was really humbling. It, it, what he said to me is, you know, in June, after this whole thing happened with the healings, I just, I took time off. I just got along with God. I was seeking him every day. I mean, for hours, just going after God. Then I got to America. I was in a ministry schedule. I was it. And he just said, hey, we had such a good time in June. And you, you've kind of slowed down. And I was like, oh, you were there when I was praying and fasting. You were actually there. You heard me. You enjoyed. There was a revelation that God, of course he was there. 
But he was there. And he was like, yeah, I like this. This is fun. We're communing. We're hanging out together. And he said, I miss you. And we spent the next four hours together. And it was awesome. It was just wonderful. And the next day, I got to drive to Denver now. The next day I had to drive to Denver and I'm about halfway there. My wife had fallen asleep and the Lord spoke to me again. See, I was used to God, me, me pursuing God, right? You know, as the deer, I'm like the deer, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. I never thought of God pursuing me. I never thought of God liking me so much that he would work out situations just to hang out with me. It made me feel strange, embarrassed, humbled. Like, God, why would you, it's, you know, I mean, I need to seek you, but, and you need to be like hard to get to, exclusive, you know, but you're coming after me? See, that's the real God. The hard to get to, exclusive, that's, that is the lies of the enemy. And I'm getting closer to Denver, and the Lord speaks to me, and I don't have these running conversations with God, but it was just an amazing, an amazing summer. And he said, Ron, do you know why it, I didn't answer your prayers completely during the beginning of the summer. That's when I was praying and fasting. I was asking him for more anointing, more words of knowledge to win the loss, more prophecies to win the loss, not to impress people, to win the loss. And he said, I could have answered all your prayer like that. He said, but if I did, you would have stopped seeking me and I'm enjoying it so much. It wasn't, you would have stopped seeking me and that's bad, you need to seek me. It wasn't that, it was like, I like this so much. It's so great. It's so wonderful. So I'm going to give it to you, but it's going to be little by little. Keep seeking me. Keep going after me. Fight the good fight. So friends, that's the challenge tonight. That number one, we would recognize that once we've been immersed in the Holy Spirit, He's turned our water into wine. And we got to stir it up every now and then. we got to remember that when we wake up every morning, we are called to be a witness. We are called to heal the sick, every one of us. We are called to raise the dead, every one of us. We are called to do the works of Yeshua, every one of us. But number two, that flows out of a place of intimacy with Yeshua. Father, we thank you in the name of Yeshua for this evening. And I just pray right now, that your Holy Spirit would fall on your children. Just open your heart right now. If you want to stand, you can stand. But just open your heart, open your arms, lift your hands to God and receive. If God would work all that out to spend time with someone like me, imagine how much he wants to spend time with you. He loves you. Just receive his love right now. Receive his joy, his goodness. Father, we break all the lies of the enemy that say that you're mad at us, you're displeased. Lord, we know there's discipline. That's, that's a healthy thing, that you discipline us. We know that you've called us to holiness. That's a good thing. But we also know that you never stop loving us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Just receive right now a new anointing, a fresh anointing. Tomorrow's going to be different. You know what? Tonight's going to be different. When you go out from here, some of you are going to go out to dinner, ask the waitress or the waiter if you can pray for them. You never know what's going to happen when you get your anointed hands on an unbeliever. Hallelujah. I'll just tell you this one last story. Just keep receiving, keep receiving. That same trip in Colorado, on that same four-hour stretch, as I turned around to go back, got the keys back, I stopped at Starbucks. And as I'm going through the, the drive through I said, Lord, give me a word for the young girl at the window. And nothing came to me. And I said, well, that's not going to stop me. And I got to the window and I just looked at her and I said, can I ask you something? Sure. Have you ever wondered how much God loves you? She said, yeah, I have. I said, have you ever felt his presence 
And she said, no. I said, give me your hand right now. I'm in a car. She's in the Starbucks. She reaches her hand through the window. I grab it. I pray God's blessing on her. And I just know God's going to touch her. You just got to do it. You just got to do it. You never know what's going to happen. What's the worst? Ah, felt nothing. All right. Go drink coffee. I let go of her hand. She goes, wow. She said, you made my day. I said, I don't want to make your day. I want to make your life. I said, go home. Read the book of John. Learn about Yeshua. Learn about Jesus. The point is that there's an anointing in you. It's time to use it. Father, we pray right now for everyone here who is sick in body. We just pray for healing right now. For right now, we command backs to be healed, sciatic nerves to be healed. Father God, we command hips to be healed, knees, shoulders. Oh God, Father, we come against cancer in the name of Yeshua. We come against every sickness and disease. If you need healing in your body, just take it right now. Say, I receive it in the name of Yeshua. We release your healing right now. Father God, I thank you that you love your children. Forgive me, I'm going to tell you one more story. <laughs> I got home to home. Tel Aviv is home. I got back to America in early July, July 4th actually, and I got a phone call that my, one of my best friends had been on his back for a week. Now this is after all this wave of healing, but it's always been unbelievers. And it wasn't in a congregation, it was outside where it should be. And I said, God, well, come on, if you're going to do it for the drunk guy on the airplane, then sure, this guy volunteers in the inner city, he's a dentist, and he takes one day a week and volunteers in the inner city. I said, certainly you'll heal him. I go over there, he's on his back, he literally, he's, this is the happiest guy you've ever met, and he's miserable. We pray for him, nothing happens. I get in the car, I'm so mad. I don't understand God. Why? Why? He's your, he's your child. The next day I wake up and there's an email and it just says two words in the subject. I'm healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, Ron, four hours after you left, something just, there was a twinge in my back. And after being literally lying down for seven days, within 20 minutes, I was completely healed. And I was back at work the next day. And they were like, what are you doing here? Go home. He says, no, I'm healed. He's telling all his staff, believers, unbelievers, God healed me. So it not only works for unbelievers, but for his children too. So take it right now. We receive, Father, your healing, your blessing, your life, your joy. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Yeshua. There is no one like you. You are the best. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your voice. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.